Uh, we had one in Evergreen uh, last year, and uh, we'll plan on continuing them in the area and uh, getting down to, to Bailey soon. And um, uh, we were in Frisco. I think we have one in Frisco coming up as well, and we have them there regularly as well. But um, also, please, we would love your suggestions about ways that I can better uh, listen to folks here in Conifer and, uh, and do outreach here. Uh, and uh, get to know some of your friends and neighbors. As you know, um, this area was added to this uh, second congressional district just uh, last cycle. So um, I want to introduce my Colorado Chief of Staff, Lisa Kaufman, is here. Um, Nisa Erickson is outside. She, um, hi Nisa. Nisa works out of Frisco and covers uh, the, the western area of the district for me. So she is the main person in the community that will attend community events when I'm back in D.C. on your behalf. Dan Turrentine is here, who's our Washington, D.C. Chief of Staff. So I may turn to him on some things if you uh, get into the weeds on some, some policy issues. Uh, and I uh, want to say how excited I am, frankly, to be back here where there's some sanity uh, here in Congress. Um, this is a, I mean, I am just so honored to do this job. I mean, it's an amazing, uh, you know, job serving you all there. I mean, just last week I was at the White House meeting with the president in a small group about trade policy. Um, and you go to the next thing, and we're trying to, you know, work on legislation on employment non-discrimination, obviously immigration, the border crisis. I got to go down for 24 hours to, um, with some other senators and Congress people, to um, just last two weekends ago, uh, to um, uh, McAllen and uh, San Antonio Lackland Air Force Base. Uh, and two weeks before that, I, I went to the San Ysidro crossing in San Diego. So I hadn't, you know, the, the issue, as you know, just boom, all of a sudden we had a crisis at our border. And I hadn't really tor toured the border before. I mean, I, I crossed it once, but I never, um, so we really had to learn and learn on that. And Congress still hasn't, hasn't acted on anything related to the border, unfortunately. I'm happy to talk about our proposals. The House did pass something, but as you know, for it to become a law, the House, the Senate, the President, they all need to agree on something, and they all... Uh, left town and uh, nothing happened with regard to the border. However, the only good news there is that the, the border, the crisis of a few weeks ago is slowly ebbing, but of course there's no guarantee that there couldn't, we couldn't be deluged with another uh, uh, um, onslaught of uh, unaccompanied minors at some point in the future, but it has diminished since the heights of a few weeks ago. So um, the way uh, we usually do these is I'll give you a five or ten minute update about what's going on in Washington, uh, and then I'm all ears and want to hear um, your ideas about what we can do to move our country forward, your thoughts, obviously any questions about where things are in the legislative process, we're here to answer you on those and what you'd like me to focus on for you on uh, your behalf in Washington. So um, I'll start by giving a little bit of an update. Uh, Congress is, uh, is now uh, out of session for a month. We go back in September for two months, and then we also will have a lame duck session, which is very important because there's a lot of stuff that expires before the end of the year. Uh, there's the biggest fights over the last year have been about kind of the the federal budget, the whole, whether we shut down, shut down government, how do we agree on a budget, how do we balance the budget deficit, how do we cut spending, uh, what do we look at. Um, the, I'll give you the good news and the bad news. The good news is we've backed our way into making pro pro progress on the budget deficit. So our deficit is, uh, has, is decreased by about half over the last um, three years. Now some of that is because there's been uh, economic recovery, not enough, but it's it started from where we were three or four years ago. But frankly, the other part of that is the cuts that we've made in the operational budget. Uh, we again, we so we backed our way into that. There was a sequester. There's a sequester part of that was undone, but we found offsetting cuts. Um, but there's not been a lot of progress around making sure that our entitlement programs or have the stability they need or on stable footing. We have large unfunded liabilities we have. Frankly, that's the bigger part to the medium to long term budget issues we face than just the operational part. Uh, and then within that context, looking at looking at revenues as well. So we backed our way into some progress, but um, uh, you've seen the fights and, you know, government shutting down and all those things happening. And, uh, sometimes progress happens despite the best effort of politicians, so that's what we have a little bit of uh, in this regard. Um, as you uh, may or may not know, I do focus a lot on education issues. Uh, that was my prior experience. I, I did really two things before I was in Congress. One was business, so I do focus on a lot, of, a lot of tech and small business issues and competitiveness issues. The other is education. That's the committee I serve on. Uh, and we were able to actually pass in the House several education bills that I uh, sponsored or co-sponsored. Um, one is a reauthorization of the 
federal charter school program, uh, which is provides uh, support to get charter schools off the ground. Um, and we passed it by a vote of, I think, 360 to 50 or so. Uh, and then we also passed one around um, competency-based education for higher ed, so it's like online education, basically, for college, um, which is allowed, but um, it's, it's very difficult to access. We have a, a great one in our district. CSU Global is one of the leading providers. It's a division of CSU. So it's basically allowing more opportunities for kids to take online college courses. Um, doesn't mean they're for everybody, doesn't by any means favor it over anything else, but they're, they're good for a number of reasons. It can, for, done correctly, it can provide the opportunity to provide an even more customized education at a lower cost. So better education, lower cost. Doesn't mean that everybody out there is doing it right, that's certainly not the case. But you can, as a student, proceed faster or slower, self-paced, you can do it while you work in your spare time, uh, and obviously the costs are considerably less than the physical infrastructure you are basically paying for uh, if you attend a, a four-year university. Um, we're also excited in our district that Colorado Mountain College is now accredited as a four-year university. I supported that state legislation and have worked with them as well. Uh, so those are some of the things that uh, we have uh, been working on. We are also at the near the uh, finishing stage. We, we just uh, uh, have completed our work on a Summit County Recreation and Wilderness Bill that we have been working on for, for um, three years. Nisa Erickson has been tireless in that regard. Just trying to, and, and some of you might recreate there, and uh, we have some areas like 10 Mile, where we have areas where uh, there'll be biking, mountain biking uh, areas. Some areas that are already managed as wilderness, they're already managed will be, will be uh, designated wilderness. Essentially when we set out to, and, and the reason we have to deal with this issue, about half the district that we live in is owned by the federal government, so we constantly deal with like landlord issues, if you will, so we were able to do a land exchange in Summit County um, uh, where we gave 40 acres to the county that they're going to put low income housing on in exchange for land elsewhere that they gave to the federal government. Um, our managing principle in kind of all the wilderness stuff is we don't want to close any trails that people currently legally use for recreation. So when people are biking uh, or motorized users, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to um, remove areas that people enjoy themselves in, but we do want to protect in perpetuity uh, wilderness areas where we can that hikers and, and, and others can enjoy uh, in perpetuity. So those are challenging things because there's a lot of community interest, but we brought most of the stakeholders on board and we just completed that work. We also recently were able to help get the funding and completed the um, fire suppression system in Eisenhower Tunnel, which I'm touring, I think, in the next week or two, but um, it's a, there's one on both ends now, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, State-of-the-art fire suppression system, I think it will ultimately save lives at some point, we know that, but even more importantly, uh, in the meantime, obviously nothing's more important than saving lives, but, but on an everyday basis, it'll actually improve the flow of traffic uh, in and out as well. Highway 70 remains a challenge, as you know, there's not a comprehensive plan for that. Um, like there was for 36, which we're in the final stages of, and now we're kind of moving on to North 25, uh, South 25 already done through T-Rex. But 70 uh, has always been a little bit elusive in terms of what we actually need to do with the geophysical characteristics of it, with the tunnel. Uh, they continue to experiment with zip lanes uh, and other innovations, and we encourage that. We try to promote that, uh, and we try to encourage out-of-the-box thinking about, about long-term solutions. So uh, I'll, let me cover foreign policy a little bit because it's one of those areas that just heated up all of a sudden. You got Ukraine, you got Israel and Palestine, you got uh, the Islamic State, you got everything going on there. Um, uh, it's been uh, a very unstable time in the world, and um, uh, I've been to um, uh, West Bank uh, and Israel and Egypt. Uh, I have not yet been to uh, the Ukraine, but I'll probably at some point need to need to go there firsthand to see what's going on on, but. Um, uh, you know, the instability is obviously not good for our country. We support stable policy. On the, the flip side of that is it's very challenging to figure out what our constructive role is. I mean, trying to encourage the Israelis and Palestinians to get together and establish a long-term two-state solution peace is a policy that I support. Obviously, standing up to Russian imperialism is very important. Uh, at the same time, we don't want to seek a conflict with Russia, but we also can't, you know, stand idly by while they essentially invade or annex their neighbors. Um, the, Islam, the rise of the Islamic State, which is an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, uh, is a very dangerous development. They now control large portions of Iraq and uh, eastern Syria uh, and have established their own state. Uh, the only major kind of policy that I support, I, and I've been to that area of the world, as I said, um, I've been to Iraq and um, 
Kuwait uh, on your behalf as well. Uh, I do co-chair the uh, Kurdish caucus, uh, and it looks like what we're heading towards, which I do support, is the establishment of a Kurdish state. Kurds have been long-term allies of ours, as you know. Uh, I think it provides the opportunity for a stable country that we can support and work with in, in uh, northern Iraq, essentially. There had been a lot of political complexities to that because of Turkey's position and others, but in light of the recent developments and the threat of others, uh, the way seems to be cleared for the establishment of a Kurdish state. They, of course, have to vote on that first. I, I, um, I met with Kurdish representatives last week. I, they, I think they said they're going to have a vote on that at some point. I expect it would pass overwhelmingly in, in the Kurdish areas. Um, but some of those maps that were drawn in, was it 1905 or whatever, by the French and British might not work out. It's, it's the last 100 years, but they might not, uh, they might, uh, they, the end of those, uh, that might be, might be approaching us. It's just the French and British were printing them. They were just, yeah, you know, they were, you know, we draw this, draw that. Um, so with that, let's open it up. Again, your ideas, your thoughts, your questions. would love to hear what you'd like me to be working on. Um, uh, your ideas about how we can move our country forward, and obviously some of the local issues here, just to make sure that I'm on top of those, especially the ones that have a federal dimension, would be happy to hear. Yes? I'm interested in hearing a little more about the fracking issue, mm -hmm. and if that that uh, ballot initiative is going forward, and, and a little more about, I know you're in the forefront of this, and finally talked to a human being about it that can maybe describe a little bit about what's going on and if we have an opportunity to do that. Sure. So um, a lot of the district that I represent, uh, not so much here, but uh, Loveland and Broomfield and that kind of area, Erie, is right in the area where fracking has come into kind of the urban and urban <coughs> communities. And so uh, this was, I, you know, uh, this, this came to my attention in 2011 when there was a group of moms in Erie that were very concerned that fracking was occurring right near their kids' elementary school, Red Hawk Elementary School. And I met with them, they brought this to my attention, and um, I said, well, you know, how can this be? It's like right next to the playground, couldn't they do it a little bit further away? I uh, tried to encourage the, the, the company in Canada to do it in a different place, but uh, they, you know, didn't, weren't dissuaded. And because of not just that, but because of this type of activity in a number of different areas, uh, it has alienated people. It has alienated people from fracking. So what you've seen is in the district I represent, four of the five largest cities have actually passed moratoriums or bans on fracking. Uh, and those are uh, currently uh, facing lawsuits uh, regarding the legality of those. So I have been involved since then in trying to kind of broker some kind of peace or, or settlement where uh, fracking can occur in areas, uh, but not in areas where, you know, homeowners are you know, or, or it's unsafe for homeowners, or they have to leave their own home for two months because it's too loud or the industrial activity is occurring. Uh, there's different ways to do that. Um, there's been talks about, you know, some type of role that cities or counties can play in the planning and zoning for it. Um, now I'll kind of catch you up to where it is today. I joined the governor earlier today. Uh, the governor announced that if this uh, potential compromise can go through, they would drop the lawsuit against Longmont. Now, not the lawsuit. Longmont, did, Longmont has the unique distinction of having two lawsuits against them related to fracking. Because <laughs> the city council passed rules related to fracking that are, I think are sensible. I'll talk about them in a minute. But then they immediately got sued by the state. And then the citizens were so upset that their rules were being sued that they actually put a thing on to ban it. And then, and then the voters banned it. So though they got sued on that, then they got sued on the rules. So the governor agreed to drop the rules lawsuit against Longmont. The ban, the ban will probably be overturned. It got overturned in the first court. It goes to the next court. But the important thing for people in areas that are affected by this is that they have some say in this development, as they do for any other kind of development in their area. I mean, if you're in a residential subdevelopment, you know, the zoning authority is not going to put a huge factory in there right in the middle of a residential subdevelopment. So this is like a small factory, not a huge factory, but still, you want to be sensitive to where people live and the quality of life and make sure it's uh, in an area where it doesn't hurt anybody's uh, health or quality of life. So that's been my focus um, in addressing those concerns of my constituents and whether it's at the ballot box, whether it's uh, through legislation, whether it's through rule. Uh, there's, most of them are non-federal, but obviously on behalf of my constituents, this is an issue that when I go to town halls in Loveland or Broomfield, I mean, this is like one of the big ones we hear about. It doesn't surprise me you brought it up here, but I imagine it's not, you know, the top issue here. But um, that's, kind of, that's kind of where that is. Well, did the ballot initiative, did you get enough signatures for this to go on about, or where is that at? 
Uh, again, I, I wouldn't be necessarily the authority on that. It's my understanding that um, there are pro oil and gas initiatives, and then there are there are initiatives that limit where they can frack. This this um, first step that the governor announced is that both sides would would withdraw initiatives and have a commission uh, that puts elevates citizens, uh, puts them at the table with oil and gas in equal numbers to see if we can figure out a framework for Colorado, recommending to the legislature in February how to address this. Um, in the meantime, dropping the Longmont lawsuit and also uh, enforcing larger setbacks. So that is the framework that the governor talked about this morning, which I think is a acceptable framework. It's a step forward in empowering citizens uh, to be able to address this issue. Well, you know, can I just say one thing? Sure. Uh, the Denver sure. Post, um, a few days ago, they had an article that said that there were two spills a day happening somewhere in yes, Colorado every day. Pretty much. And they said that of those spills, 15% actually were affecting groundwater somewhere. And that if they weren't big enough, then they didn't have to get even reported to local residents. And I mean, all of this information, it seems like it's not just a matter of whether people can frack or not frack. It's like, what is really going on with this whole industry? And how informed are we as to how this is affecting our whole state? I mean, that's where it affects us here. They're not going to be doing fracking outside our door. but. It affects us on the big scale. Sure. If, if this information sure. is Sure. Well, it affects our economy as a state because we, uh, one of our competitive advantages is our, you know, healthy outdoor lifestyles. We market based on that. If people are moving to subdevelopments where they have to evacuate because of spills or because of explosions, we get a bad reputation as a state. So, um, look, a spill, there's about 400 in the last year um, here in Colorado. So I don't know if that's quite two a day, but um, it's close to it. Now, again, it's a different scenario. If you have, you know, a farm in unincorporated Weld County, and there's a spill on your property and there's no one near, that's a very different protocol uh, than if you're in a crowded residential subdevelopment and there's a spill where there's a playground right near it and, you know, 16 houses that are a couple hundred feet away. So that's, that's the challenge we have. Colorado doesn't really have the framework for that in place. Uh, I think there's um, uh, a, a huge need to do that and there's different ways to do that, um, but it, it has to occur or it could really, uh, uh, you know, hurt our state. And so that's, I've been focused on, on helping that happen however I can. So you're talking <clears throat> about state and local initiatives, yeah. but your purview is at the federal level. What is going on at the federal level that, that would sort of update the way we think about mineral and, and uh, natural resources extraction in general? So a lot. Uh, so a lot of this is state and local, um, but national. There's several pieces um, in terms of legislation that I support. Uh, one um, is basically the Breathe and the Fresher Act, which would remove the exemption that fracking has currently from the Clean Air Act and remove the exemption it has from the Clean Water Act. So, so let's talk about the Clean Air Act. This is the main vehicle that we look at air quality, and uh, you know uh, you have factory, you have a coal plant, those are all looked at under the clean air. It doesn't mean they're banned, they exist, right? But you have, you know, certain things you need to do for a coal plant, certain things you need to do. Fracking has been exempt under what they call the small site exemption, because each fracking pad is quite small. Its, its emissions are uh, not large. But the problem is, when you have 20,000 of them in Weld County, in a limited area, all of a sudden, the emission profile is like several fact. I mean, several factories. Again, there are areas of Wyoming that have worse air quality than Los Angeles, uh, and so it becomes an air quality issue. Uh, you need to look at the concentration of fracking in a limited area, uh, and again, it doesn't mean it's uh, prevented or banned, but it needs to be looked at like any other any other polluting activity. Uh, and same with the Clean Water Act, also the Frac Act, which deals with disclosure of what uh, liquids are being injected underground. Uh, so those would be the, the only other federal issue is um, federal land fracking, uh, and there are mineral leases, of course, in Colorado, not mostly in our area, but uh, Western Slope, and so uh, there, because uh, we, the people who own that, are the landlords. You are, you're the landlords. Uh, we just want to do normal things like making sure that they uh, don't harm the property and are thoughtful about how they extract it and, and all that. Are you suggesting there's twenty-two thousand fracking? Operations going on in Weld County. There's about forty thousand active wells in the state. No, you you said I'm going to well, well, you. Well, you said there are twenty two thousand. Well, well, 
fracking. Look, uh, uh, they will, fr so on. fracking means different At any things. Given time, that is uh, that no, no, no. So ridiculous. The, uh, the, the act of fracking stage only lasts for uh, you know a couple days. So, what what when people talk about fracking though, they are generally talking about any well that has been fracked. So, but in terms of air pollution, which is what you were referring to, uh, it's not there's, from there's only yeah. only the active fracking site. Is producing any sort of emission? No, no, no. The act, the active fracking stage is not producing emissions. The active fracking stage is when they inject the fluids underground. Uh, the emissions are over the next several years. What, can what? you give me an example? What an emission is from a fracking? Methane. Yeah. Out of the ground? No. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, if you've ever, I've been on a number of fracking sites, so they have a little valve that releases mm -hmm. releases the methane or other gases regularly. So uh, that's what the new state air quality controls were about. They were about uh, methane recapture equipment, fairly inexpensive, that on all wells going forward, they need to be equipped with that. Which I just want to understand. Yeah. Methane is one the of the worst that, greenhouse yeah. gases. So, so, so the fracking, again, the active fracking stage is the injection of fluids underground. That usually lasts a couple days. Um, the, um, the, the emissions are not related to that. I mean, maybe there's something associated with that, but it, generally they're just over the several year period. Um, uh, about, about more than half the production from the wells uh, is in the first two years. And they, they produce for sometimes 15 or 20 years, but uh, very little during that long tail. Most of the production is during the first two years. So a follow-up question. As a opponent of fracking, do you support compensating the people who own those mineral rights? Well, I I'm, not a, I'm not an opponent of fracking. If you're um, going to shut down their wells, essentially, or, or keep them from gaining uh, a production capacity. Well, I mean, I sort of production. Let me yeah. finish, please. Keep them from getting their full production off the well, off the property that they own. Do you support compensating them for their loss, or is it a taking? Well, I've never supported shutting down any operating wells, um, nor have I uh, opposed fracking. Uh, what we're talking about is the zoning of fracking. So, um, you know, I think it's very reasonable that many cities and counties, uh, like they have zoning rules regarding anything, you can't put a store in a residential neighborhood in most areas. So they, they do that function, you know, and I don't weigh in one way or the other. Because it hurt, hurts the neighborhood? If that's what people so, feel. So are you know. opposed to tax increment financing where uh, municipal government can come in to an area and take your family homestead away from you and build something that they it's not the same. It's like it is the same. regulating sir, sir, pipe emissions I'm, from a the car. The question isn't, well, isn't directed to you. Just, so it's anyway. anyway. Taxpayer increment financing for what again? Well, condemnation. for example, yeah, they can condemn somebody's homestead property for the better good of the community. Well, that hurts. That hurts the surrounding residential property, just like fracking. I just want to know if there's consistency in your position. Look, I'm I'm for um, I'm generally defend what my communities want to do. So uh, you know, when 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 they want to pass rules on different activities. I mean, I don't, I don't, I never, I don't provide any input. I've never supported or opposed any, for instance, of the fracking bans that have been on the ballots in any of the cities I represent. But once they decide, and I have a city in my district, Loveland, which decided to have fracking, and I support their ability to have it. I have cities like Broomfield, Lafayette, and Fort Collins that decided not to. I support their ability not to. Um, I think it's like any other, you know, any other activity, and I support their, just marijuana is another example. I mean, I support, uh, Towns and counties deciding if they want to have dispensaries. I mean, I, I you know, I don't have an opinion on that. I, I would be against the, the federal government coming in and shutting them down if they choose to have it, and I would be against somebody forcing them to have dispensaries if they don't want to have it. So, um, the more the closer we can return, you know, to the to the people, um, I think the better. And so, I support those things. Okay, thank you. Well, since she opened the Pandora's box on the fracking, yeah. I got a related question. Uh, apart from the potential emissions issues and all the other stuff. I read somewhere recently that the average fracked well takes about 4 million gallons of water, plus all the chemicals that are mixed in for the fluids and the lubricants and all that. So given Colorado's sort of general water condition, although we had more rain this year than typical, uh, 4 million gallons per well is not an insignificant amount of water in a water shortage state where we still got severe drought in the southeast. How do we make compromise to allow that much water being used for one well? when you look at the overall usage of water residentially mm -hmm. and commercially and everything else versus one well. So I would have to, um, and I don't know, I, I assume if, if you know, I, I don't know what the right number is, but yes, it's water, it's water intense. 
Um, in the grand scheme of things, it's still a fairly small percentage of water in the state, but even, uh, and I don't, I, I wish I had the statistic, maybe we could look it up, but I, I don't know if it was, you know, 1% or 2%, but it's, it's growing, and so that, you know, we, we should absolutely look at it, uh, just as we look at ag, just as we look at uh, residential, uh, it's part of the water picture, so you can't, you can't ignore that in a state where water is very important. Well, uh, I can put it in perspective, we lived in Southern California a long time ago, and we had a swimming pool in the backyard that was about 25,000 gallons. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Four million gallons would be the equivalent of 160 swimming pools, which is not an insignificant amount of water. Yeah. If you're pumping it in at your residential water rate, which they're not, they're paying commercial water and rates so, or agricultural yeah. water Some rate. of them are looking at reclaiming some of that water. Uh, uh, I know that. And, uh, I mean, that's the more important thing, I think, is not just the water usage, but once that stuff gets injected into the ground and it starts seeping down through the layers of rock and trying to find an aquifer somewhere. It's hard to get that stuff out of the soil once it's down there. They can pull the water out, but they can't extract all the chemicals 100%. So I'm concerned about where that stuff ends up long term as far as residential or commercial water extraction for drinking or other purposes. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the aggregate water usage is something that we look at. I mean, again, not just by itself, but there's there's Water is very important in our state, so when we look at residential ag fracking, um, you know, we should we should look at anything. You know, what are we doing with our water resources? Um, we do want to make sure, of course, that we have the right uh, regs, which I think we do on the, you know, concrete casing to make sure that the water is not, uh, the chemicals are not seeping out of the, the system at uh, inappropriate depths. Um, but you know, water's part of the picture. Um, surface spills, we talked about surface spills. Those are an immediate, can be an immediate problem if there's people nearby. Um, water uh, emissions, which are not necessarily uh, an issue from one, one pad, um, uh, unless you're like right next to it downwind, but generally you're more of an aggregate issue. Do they, do they use the burn of on the flare? So, um, or do they just let it go? I mean, I, yeah. from my house, yeah. Uh, you know, you know the big uh, landfill over by the airport. Yeah, where are you? Where do you? Where I live up on top of Kester Road, which okay. is up on top of the mountain. I can see all yeah. the way town. I can see the flare when they're burning methane off that landfill yeah. from my house. So there's a lot of methane comes out of the garbage too. A lot of methane comes out of our cows. Mm -hmm. And and you know, it's it's. I think the cows probably produce more methane than the wells do. Because if it was um, e it's, it's economical. Recover it. They're going to recover it. Well, well, so um, the problem, and that, the, the, so um, most of it is not flared here. Um, in in South Dakota, you, you, you've seen these night maps, and a lot of it is flared. Yeah. Um, so here, some of it uh, is recaptured, um, but um, a lot of it is emitted. So it is, you know, a significant pollutant. You're of course correct. It's not the only source of methane. Of course, there's many others. Um, I don't think, it, it, again, it, it has more to do with, with areas where there's a lot of fracking in a concentrated area, um, and then the air quality in that, in that area. Since our whole economy is petrochemical based, where do you stand on the pipeline? Um, well, our whole economy is, so energy, energy is very important, okay. as we're so. But still, petrochemical yeah. is a major, used to be coal, but yeah. we're, well, We're regulating that out of this distance. Um, you know, so the pipeline, uh, from my perspective, um, I've been, would love to hear your thoughts on it. I mean, I've been kind of lukewarm on it. I've been, uh, um, it obviously is a huge favor to Canada. There's no doubt about that. Canadians benefit immensely from it. Um, I don't see a tremendous benefit for our country from the pipeline. Um, we, uh, I support, you know, all the above energy approach. Obviously, developing renewable energy is critical. Uh, we, for the foreseeable future, we use oil and gas and uh, oil and gas extraction activities in Colorado are certainly going to be part of that. But with regard to Canada, I mean, they have alternatives um, that seem to be <coughs> less problematic from our perspective, and whether that's uh, trains or an east-west pipeline involving their own country. Um, there are a lot of issues in the areas that the pipeline was proposed to go through. Uh, and, you know, it has a review process. What I've told people is it's being reviewed. and. Um, I voted against short-circuiting that review process to approve it, but, you know, if it gets approved, it gets approved. Um, the review is like the kid there. in Mexico, though. He's going to well, be there next Christmas, probably. What I would focus on you know? uh, for our, my decision-making process, what would be 
any benefits or costs to our country, because that's what we care about. Are there short-term jobs? Yes, but short-term jobs aren't the most exciting things in the world. It does benefit, I think, you know, the port city of New Orleans. They like it. Uh, it obviously benefits Canada. Uh, in terms of costs, you know, you're looking at a lot of opposition along the route. Um, you know, you're looking at um, so what benefit does it have for America. Domain involved with that? Are, they, are people's land? People's well, it goes over land? private land, of course, right. yeah. And, the, and some of those people are, are not always happy. doing it for that reason, right? Yeah. And they've already had to re they've already had to change the the routing of it a couple times because of issues in, in well, Kansas. Then what's the solution for energy independence? How do we get off of sending our kids to the to the Middle East to get killed to then walk away before the job's done? And yeah. just so we have enough oil to keep us going. Well, um, so you know another the solar's not gonna do it. Well, these these are these are growing over time, solar and wind. Um, but in the meantime, I, I do some work with uh, Mexico relations. So we've been very excited about their Pemex reforms down there. They have vast uh, oil resources, but they've been really hampered in accessing them because they have a lot of corruption in their state-owned oil company. They have moved in the direction with their newly elected president Enrique Peña Nieto and the administration, where they are doing long-term joint operating agreements with American companies and multinational companies for extraction in Mexico. So I'm very excited about increased production out of Mexico. Uh, we will continue because of uh, unconventional drilling technology here in our country to increase production. Also very exciting. Uh, again, finding the right way to do it in Colorado where communities are protected and, and we're able to get natural resources is going to be really important. Really important. So um, those trends are positive. Um, they're good. I don't see how, if you know, going back to the, the the pipeline, I don't see how that contributes to it. That's mostly oil for export anyway. Right. Uh, Isn't going that pretty much what the story is? What's Isn't that? Isn't that pretty much what the story is? It is. For, yeah, well, it's, it's for export for global markets. Right. Yeah. Is there any analysis that you've seen that would compare the short and long term jobs and economic benefit of a pipeline versus investing similar amounts of money? into renewables. Um, you know, it seems a red herring to be talking about jobs building a pipeline when the same workers could be building uh, wind machines or solar plants or something of this nature. It, do you know of any um, substantive research that's been done to compare those? I haven't, I haven't seen that. Um, in Colorado, um, obviously we've had growth in energy jobs across the board. <laughs> Uh, so we've had deployment of some large-scale wind farms in eastern Colorado. We have increased jobs in conventional oil and gas. Um, solar, we lost some production jobs because China became a very low-cost producer, but the good news is that a lot of their production, I mean, it's still happening. I mean, there's more and more solar going in. So, um, there's, yeah, you're, but you're right. There's no, there's jobs in, 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 we have to produce energy. So however you produce it, uh, people work on that and produce it. And uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, it'll take uh, multiple sources to read our goals. But I mean, the more we can obviously move towards renewable, the more uh, the closer we are to energy independence. Okay. Yes. All energy, all the time here in Conifer. Hey, I'm going to change idea. the subject okay. just for a moment. Sure. Okay. Um, my name is Martha. I'm a constituent, uh, and I'm a volunteer with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, which is an advocacy group, nonpartisan in nature, affiliated with the American Cancer Society. Um, it's nonpartisan because, as my button says, cancer is nonpartisan. And I wanted to ask you about some legislation that is pending in Congress concerning palliative care uh, and the advancement of training and availability of team-oriented uh, palliative care. Okay. So, and if I could just state a, make a couple statements sure. about background so that people know where I'm, we're coming from on this. This is legislation that has been initiated by the uh, Cancer Action Network. And uh, that's because there are over 90 million people in this country who are suffering from cancer or other major illnesses that have lots of very serious side effects such as pain and other uh, issues associated with their treatment. Um, which also need to be addressed. Some hospitals in some cities do this extremely well. Um, but many don't, especially smaller uh, hospitals, rural areas, etc. So it's not an even 
playing field here for people who are facing treatment for any serious illness. Um, and so the palliative care idea is a team medical approach which is going to help people in treatment for serious illnesses with those other issues besides killing the cancer or besides healing your heart or whatever your illness is. And it's a team approach that uh, treats the whole patient. And what happens is you get a better quality of life during treatment, you get a better outcome, scientific studies have shown this, and on top of that, it oftentimes reduces the expense of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a couple of bills in Congress now and in the House we have I'm going to make sure that we write those down. Where's Dan? Dan, 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 Lisa? Okay. Okay. I'll write down the bills. That, okay. That's perfect. We have Bill 1666 and also Bill 1339. You got that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they're uh, companion bills. They work mm -hmm. together to uh, help produce <coughs> this better uh, training and better availability, ultimately, of palliative care for all. Folks well, palliative care is, yeah, it's, it's obviously I want to look at the bills, but I'm in general I'm a big fan of it because it's usually higher quality for people than, than, than being in a hospital, and obviously lower cost, that's something we all benefit from, so it's usually a win-win for everybody, it's a more caring Oh yeah, uh, absolutely, and I want to make sure everybody knows, I am not talking about exclusively end-of-life care. Mm -hmm. Palliative care can start at the moment of diagnosis, because if anybody in here is a cancer survivor, they know that minute that you hear those words, you have cancer, uh, you know, your blood pressure just shot up about 100 points, if nothing else. Um, but it's a really, really serious situation when you have any number of serious illnesses. So we have these two bills, and uh, one is called the Patient-Centered Quality Care for Life Act. The other one is the Palliative Care and Hospice Education and Training Act. So taken together, these would improve the picture for the availability of palliative care to Americans in, who are in that boat. Mm -hmm. And if I might add one other rather pragmatic but important fact about these bills. We don't have an official uh, Office of Budget um, mm -hmm. analysis yet. However, they have looked at what this would entail and the estimated cost for one of those bills is about $30 million over five years, which if you guys have heard anything about our federal, federal budget, that's um, a very low ticket item. The other bill, about $50 million over five years. So we're talking about something that can potentially help a whole lot of people mm -hmm. for a, a very low price tag. And so I'm here to ask you, will you please co-sponsor these two bills. So thank you. We wrote them down, and we will we will go look at them. Okay, so we'll, I appreciate that very much. If you can give your name to Nisa, we can also get back to you with what we do on we'll this. We'll do. We'll do. Thank you yes. so much. I actually have a couple of issues, so okay. since I, I only have one chance, I'm going to save them all. I'm, I'm a consultant really working good. with nonprofits similar to this one mm -hmm. that serve low-income people mm -hmm. mostly, um, and I have an adult son with a intellectual and developmental disability mm -hmm. and another son in college. So my concerns start with the whole community of people who are living in poverty. That actually includes my son who has an intellectual and developmental disability, mm -hmm. who's on food stamps, who is on Medicaid, everything he needs to survive independently in the community. I'm very, very upset with Congress for cutting food stamps mm -hmm. and any program that is hurting low-income people. Charities cannot replace the money that individuals receive from food stamps and from, from health programs. They just can't raise enough money. The people who work here will tell you that. There's, it, it just doesn't work that way. So I'm, it, it's just a statement to you to take back to, to your okay. colleagues, some of them from Colorado, who support cutting things like this. And then my second item is about student loans. Mm -hmm. My youngest son is in college. We're, we're getting crushed. 
Mm -hmm. The rate is going at? up. Where's Port he Lewis. Port Lewis, great. Yeah. Durango, yeah. Environmental. If only he was part Native American, right? He actually is, and oh. I didn't know it until oh, no. after he started. They get, you're actually, it's a, under Indian treaties, it's free for Native Americans to attend Port it Lewis. It is, so. and he's an environmental studies yeah. major, so you'll be seeing him. <laughs> yeah, we'll look forward to it. But anyway, student yeah. loan, okay. um, the interest rates have gone up, and you know we have the parent loan, we have the student loan, and they need help. Kids, kids need help, you know, with their sure. student loans. And I know there's been some things, but if you could talk about sure. what might be. At least be. a decent interest so, rate for God's sake. Right. So I mean, I certainly agree on food stamps. When I look at what what we need to cut, the last places I would cut yeah. would be part things that help those that that that. Are you know barely getting by? I mean, I would. There's there's plenty of fat in the federal budget. The, the last place you want to go uh, is these kind of sustenance programs where you uh, either throw people further into poverty or force them even more on a government reliance because you know, they can't even put food on their table working. And most people who are food stamps, they work. Just so you know, it's the it's it's the working poor generally people with disabilities as well, but working poor. So I mean, you know, it's when you're earning uh, minimum wage, you know, and it's sixteen thousand dollars a year. Um, you know, the food stamps are what help you uh, subsist and not have to go completely on the public dole or on welfare or, or just give up altogether. Um, so again, that, I think that that should be the last place you cut. It's a teeny, teeny part of our budget and there's plenty of other areas to cut, which and I've offered amendments to cut a lot of different things, that not being one of them against cutting that. Student loans, um, we have a uh, cost of college education has gone up you know, uh, between 10 to 15 percent a year for the last decade. So I mean, it's just a lot more than when any of us went to college. If you went to college, um, my parents were only able to go to college because of student loans, uh, and you know today they would have graduated with enormous debt loans. And I don't know if they could have taken the life path they did. My um, mother's a poet. My father's an artist, and uh, my father's a PhD in physics. And he moved out to Boulder to work at NOAA, and uh, he was able to leave that job after four or five years to just you know, take a chance and try to sell their poetry and art out of their pickup truck. If they had the type of debt load that people have today, he probably, I mean, it would have been fine, but he would have had, to, they never would have been able to start the company they started, which employs 40 people in Boulder, uh, and, uh, you know, bring their uh, creative vision to the world and be self-employed. Uh, he would have probably had to continue, you know, over, you know, working uh, there. So, I mean, it, it empowers people. Uh, to make choices that they want to work. Maybe it's being a teacher, maybe it's working in a nonprofit. But when you have that kind of debt load, it really limits your options. Um, the main proposal that I have, so, so the main proposal that I have in that regard is um, something called income based repayment, which is a bipartisan bill that I um, wrote with Tom Petri, which um, essentially would, it's currently an optional program within um, uh, uh, student loans, but this would essentially move everybody over to income based repayment. So you only paid. Uh, a certain percentage of your income in debt repayment until your debt is repaid. So rather than a fixed amount, it's on a percentage of your income. So in a way, if you want to go work at a nonprofit or a teacher, uh, and teachers have some special deferments too, but nonprofits don't, um, you uh, would then only have to pay a certain percentage of your income. You have to pay for more years, but that debt load would seem a lot more manageable. Uh, so that's kind of the direction I've gone. Obviously, the real direction is reducing the cost of college education. So. Some of that is state, because the reason that, for instance, our in-state tuition has gone up is because the state share of education funding has uh, gone down. I, I know CU, because that's, and CSU, because they're the ones in, in the district I represent, but they're now under 10% of their funds are from the state. It used to be um, more like a third of their funds were from the state. So they had to pass that along. So I mean, thankfully, they pass a lot of along to out-of-state students, which we really love that they have you know, students from California paying 30 grand a year to go there. That's literally, they're paying 30 grand a year there to go there. Thank goodness. But but unfortunately, they had to pass some of the costs along to the state, too, which is why that's going on. Would that um, income-based yeah. repayment, would that apply to students that already have loans? Um, so it would apply to. Um, so they would be able to convert over to it. Uh, you mean if they they've already graduated? Wait, yeah, hold on. Our, to our it. son's a junior. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I mean, he's going yeah. into a senior year. But, um, the other thing that we did, which was actually very important, is I worked very hard to try to find a way to prevent the current loan rate from doubling. You might remember that it was oh, at yes. three point four, and it was scheduled to go up at six point eight. 
And I was very frustrated because Democrats and Republicans were playing partisan politics with it, and it actually happened for a month. It was retroactively undone, and I thought it was just silly because both sides said they wanted to find a way to do it, and they were just bickering over nothing. I mean, just stuff. They wanted to blame the other side for it not happening. So I uh, tried to get them together, and eventually, thankfully, we, we not not just me. I mean, this was negotiated. Obviously, but I, I was really mad at both. And, um, you know, the Democrats were against the Republican plan, the Republicans were against the Democratic plan, but the plans were very similar, and they really just needed to meet halfway, <laughs> and they finally did. Um, but it was very frustrating to provide a lot of uncertainty, because for an entire month period, it looked like they were 6.8. They, they did correct that, but, um, so, but that was, and then we'll have to face that again, because that's set to double again uh, sometime next year. Do you think that the availability of student loans is an unintended consequence of raising tuition? Um, it's a it's a interesting point. I mean, obviously, um, you know the you know the cost is a matter of supply and demand, right? So when you have these student loans um, and they're not tied to the costs, um, you have to look at the impact. So I mean, there's been suggestions that you um, you tie it into some sort of quality indicator or you somehow, but but the truth of the matter is. So, I mean, the answer is there may be some factor there, right? But, but that doesn't mean the answer is you eliminate this program because nobody can afford college. So, uh, I, I, we really need your ideas. I mean, what is the answer? I like the online uh, and encouraging that because that can be cheaper and even better. I mean, you've got to look at quality. Because if you don't do it right, it can be cheaper and better. Um, and and um, currently, all that federal funding is tied into what we call the Carnegie units, which is the seat time. They literally have to be in the seat in the class for the credit hours to be fundable. And we all know that sometimes they're sleeping in those seats anyway. Uh, we would rather move towards outcome-based measurements, and I would rather do that across the board. So we're starting with online, but I would even look at outcome-based measurements for, for this school. Because a, a college should be rewarded for getting a student more learning in less time. Right now, they kind of draw it out because they're paid based on how long the student's there and how long the coursework is. I would love to see it align better to learning, reward the learning, not the seat time. So we're starting with online, but that also can apply to physical. But um, yeah, it's there's definitely because it rewards the wrong thing. Uh, it has it can have that effect. Hey Jared, do you want to yeah. mention our constituent services? We, we do have, uh, yeah, so we, uh, I should mention this, on, on any interactions you have with the federal government, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Administration, student loans, we, look to us as your ombudsman, call our office, we can be your advocate with the federal agency to ensure that your paperwork doesn't wind up at the bottom of some pile and never get read. So on student loans, we've been very active on particular cases where they were miscalculated or uh, the person doesn't think they were in arrears but they're being penalized or whatever it is. Um, you didn't get your veterans benefits or they were inappropriate. Um, I mean, one of the most exciting things that uh, I was able to do as a member of Congress is we had a man who served in the Korean War who, because of some paperwork issue, had not gotten the medal that he was entitled to. When we were finally able to, must have been, you know, 50 some years later, I was able to present him with that medal at the, uh, with his grandkids around, you know, at the VA hall. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we can help with. Um, we bailed the banks out a while ago. And that just seems like they're back up. It's really funny business. We lost a home to fire, and um, before before we started to rebuild, they were putting this um, lender-based insurance on it that we couldn't get off. It only covered the structure, which did not exist any longer. But Bank of America continued to put that on, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until we filed a complaint with the OCC that that we, it was lifted from us. Apparently, a lot of people are going through this now. We're at the point where we're rebuilding but they're not releasing the funds that our insurance company put into them to, to delegate them, we're not getting the money to rebuild our house. And so we go, we, on the last four days, my husband's calling like every day, every work day he's called. He's been through nine people. The first line of defense they do is that they didn't receive the paperwork or the paperwork was wrong. The second line of defense is this is not my responsibility. They pass you on to another person. We have to keep going through all of this thing. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is we're not getting the money to rebuild our house. And essentially this is our money, but they're they're just not releasing it. They won't let it go. And, and so and my, my builder goes like, well, have you been on their site to see what they are doing to people? This should be mm -hmm. absolutely illegal. This is like stealing our money because we are not able to rebuild because they won't give us the funds. 
So that's the kind of thing, Nisa, could you get her number? Uh, go if you just go ahead and get it for me. And then we'll, I think it would be Daniel Henry probably would work on it. We have somebody in our office. We did a lot, as you know, during flood recovery. Um, our district was, our state and our district devastated by flood, so we worked with FEMA insurance issues through the wazoo. Um, fires, we also have dealt with several. Um, but that's the kind of thing where we might be able to help. I don't know I if we can or so. can't, but we can we can try. It, it, at the, uh, why why are they continuing to be able to do these things to people? You know, I mean, but that's what I hear the the words. And we never we never got a loan for them. Our loan was sold here, there, and there. You know, kind of thing. You we know, ended up with them. Often, often times, there's they, what it seems like happens with these guys and some of the banks is stuff just winds up never being responded to, and at the bottom of some pile, we've had some short sales that have taken forever to go through. Where we can get involved and help. So if you have that kind of thing, we can try to help too. But um, let us um, help you with that, and we'll get your contact. Thank Lisa you. will take your contact information. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, I, I can maybe help you a little bit. I was uh, the national underwriting manager for one of the national banks, and I ran the construction department. So if you tell me what's going on, I may be able to help you. Well, the, the, um, just our I contractors draws. We'll talk afterwards. Yeah. That. I, I might be able to give you some shortcuts. Um, to uh, Sergeant Telmaresi down in Mexico, the, the Marine that was arrested five months ago and is being held in prison. I would really like to see some congressional pressure put on Mexico. We seem to be um, funding every little Mexican that wants to come across the border and create a lifelong entitlement um, with what I consider to be my Social Security money. Um, but I would really like to see pressure on them to, to return him and to build a uh, fence all the way across because I'm sick and tired of all this. We've got enough diseases coming in now. We have a number of issues with, um, they have one guy that they think they found uh, Ebola in, in New York. To so, you know, uh, we're happy to talk on the, um, I'm, I'll look into the case, but on just on just to be clear, when young, which is what young people and young Mexicans come in, uh, that improves the stability of Social Security because they're going to pay it. We don't, if, if Mexican 70 year olds were coming in, that would hurt it. But what you have is if you have 15 or 20 or 25 year olds, uh, that is part of, I think, the plan. I, I, part of, I would rather do that before cutting benefits or trying to raise taxes. I would say let's find people that are here and that are young already, you know, and make sure they're paying into Social Security. So I think that's part of the solution. Um, the offense, I do support it. It's part of the comprehensive immigration reform bill uh, that passed the Senate with more than two thirds. It takes money. The way that we do that is we pay for it by the fines that the, the people who are here illegally have to pay. So rather than say us should we should pay for it as taxpayers, we say uh, basically if you're here illegally, you have to pay a fine. That actually generates quite a bit of money, and not only does that pay for the fence, which is, um, it's more than a fence, it's the full security, but it's $40 billion. Um, not only is it the fence, but it's real security. And not only does it do that, but it also reduces the deficit by $200 billion. There's also some additional revenues in there. So and I do I, support that. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Now, I understand that these people are paying somewhere between five dollars and $10,000 to get here. So the fine for showing up should be a multiple thereof. Um, yeah, I mean, under this proposal, it's three thousand yeah. dollars. I mean, I think higher amounts have been talked about five thousand. I, I don't know what the. I, I mean, I you know somewhere in that range, I think is fine. Um, you can't if you made it like fifty thousand. In effect, nobody would pay it, so you wouldn't get any revenue from it. You wouldn't have a cent. Well, I don't know what the level is, but um, it's it's somewhere in you know somewhere in that three to five thousand dollar range, I think. Yeah. You said they're paying Social Security. No, they're not. I work for the city and county of Denver as a construction no, no, no. inspector. No, they're, they're not now. They no, do no. not. No, no, no. Most of these yeah. guys are hiring illegals, and they're not yeah. paying anything. No, no. They're taking jobs yeah. from Americans. No, no, your, your point is correct. This was saying if there was a way to, 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 to make them register and pay Social Security, yeah. like, for instance, the deferred action kids now uh, that are you know, 18, 24, 25, they are paying Social Security. People who work illegally... May or may not be so I have the contractors telling me that they're yeah. doing the phony paperwork for them and hiring these guys. And they're taking the job, the good jobs, like operating yeah, it's, engineers and stuff like that. It's, from a, it's all across the board. So some of them are actually paying into somebody else's Social Security account. Some of them are not. It's just all over. Uh, Why don't you have a account. bill to get these, uh, these employers? Uh, Find them or put them in jail. Of, that's part of this too. That's part of this approach That'll too. That'll stop so the madness is, of them coming well, here. Mandatory, uh, so it's mandatory employment verification. Okay. Now to do that, you actually need to also get, 
you, again, all this costs money, so the money should come from the fines, which it does in this. But uh, so it's a um, mandatory employment verification. But again, we have to fund the system so it's not a burden on employers and it works. By who? Who's doing the, the employer. verification? Employer would employer. <laughs> not now. No, no, now it's not. And the we have something called the Verify the now. We have something called the Verify, but only 11% uh, of businesses use it. Uh, it's also not very accurate, unfortunately. So well, most of the city guys that were checking can. on these people were looking the other yeah. way. They just so do, do, do. what we do is it's a it's a new version. What we propose under immigration is a new version. It's a, like you verify 2.0. Maybe we call it something else. Maybe we call it you verify 2.0, and then it becomes mandatory. Um, the current one doesn't have the capacity to be mandatory, and it doesn't work very well. It works. It's better than nothing, but we want to improve it, make it mandatory, and that's part of immigration reform. Um, what? Build the computers. Computers. Yeah. Okay, I could be wrong, but neither of you gentlemen appear to be Native American. I'm very glad that my grandparents were all led into this country. I was very moved by your letter about the children from mm -hmm. Central America, and I think as Americans we have a responsibility to them. I would like to have it very clear that there is a difference of thought about these children. And the use of our tax money, I support our taking care of these children. Uh, well, you know, and many of these particular kids are so issue. so yeah, and it's so it's a symptom uh, of of a lot of problems with our immigration system. The biggest of which is that there's 11 million people here illegally. Um, but having talked to these kids and been down there, absolutely, these are first and foremost kids. I'm mean, going to talk to a girl who's seven. Many of them are 12 or 13. You know, there's a few that you, you know, there's a few in there that you may not, you know, that are kind of trying to slip in and they're 16 or 17 and they're more like adults. But when you talk to, these are really kids. That's what, I mean, they're mostly 12, 13, they're 7, really 10. Um, and yes, many of them, perhaps most of them, perhaps many of them are truly what we would call refugees, meaning they could risk death if they go back. Now, again, in that group, there could be others that uh, are, don't need that. That's what this whole process of sorting it out and, and the process that we have is supposed to figure out. So we should never, as a nation, nor have we ever, nor should we ever, send anybody back who seeks refuge here to their death uh, where they have where they We've done it, though. Uh, we, 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 We've we, done it for the moms. Yeah. They helped us in Vietnam. Well, it's going to happen in Iraq with a bunch of them. No, and I support more. We have Iraqi Christians, and we need to let more of them in. There's, I mean, that's my position. As a country, we don't live up. But I always think that uh, absolutely we have a try to give more visas for Iraqi Christians and collaborators who work with us. Um, again, if there's people who risk death uh, returning to El Salvador or Guatemala, uh, they they should uh, they should be here as well. We obviously should have done more in World War II to accept more Jews into the country at that point than we did. Um, but uh, I think that's something we stand for as a country. Now, again, in with that, people are going to try to get in who are not facing that, and so that's why we have to have this process of sifting that out because we're 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 not you know we're. We, we, we have moral standards as a country, but we're not fools. So we have to be able to have the right process of figuring it out, um, where this isn't just some back doorway in here, but frankly, if there are cartels that have occupied your neighborhood and they said join the, and that's what some of these kids would say, join the gang and die. If you refuse to join the gang, they will kill you. And, and our intelligence has to, you know, we, they confirm that that is in fact the situation down there. So how did this happen to where the legal process to get in this country is so difficult and so limited that, you know, how many other people who are living here could have actually qualified to come in legally? They weren't criminals, they weren't bad people, but somehow we closed the door. Yeah. And, and <coughs> we shouldn't close the door on on immigrants like that. If they, if they can follow the process, the process though, maybe you can explain to people what the process is and how yeah. long a wait there is. Yeah, the process is, is, is just broken. I mean, it, that's what we're trying to update with immigration reform. So we do so many boneheaded things as a country. Like, look at CU Engineering Graduate School. Uh, you know, in many of the different disciplines, it's about a, a quarter to a third. Like, CU Graduate Masters, about many foreign nationals on student visas from India, from China. And after they graduate, instead of saying you'd be great here as Americans, which you'd think they would be, we're saying you have to leave the country, your student visa is over, 
And guess what? The jobs follow them, guys. It's a global economy. When you need to hire a math PhD or a computer science PhD, the companies really don't care where they are. And so that's why they're expanding more in India than they are here. And that's part of it right there. So, I mean, that's obvious. And then when we talk about our farms, right? Farmers, uh, they don't have a legal way to do it. I mean, you could, there's a small, pro this program, that program, but they are, there's not a realistic way where we can get the workers we need. So part of what we need to do, this is called the future flow issue. In immigration reform, you need to do the border security, you need to do the employment verification. You also have to address the future flow. So we have that right number of people where we need, where it doesn't take jobs away from Americans, but uh, it also makes sure that there's no incentive to do this under the table, illegally violating our laws. It should all be out in the open, above board. And I guess with the immigration reform bill, I mean, I can critique parts of it too. Doesn't get it perfect. There's no question. But is it better than the status quo? Absolutely. It gets it a lot better than how we have it now. It's just totally well, is it the status quo that the law, existing law is just being ignored? Yeah, totally. The, the, the status quo is chaos. It's just total chaos. Laws? Absolutely. I mean, we so, need to so who, who is in suggesting and laws. why is it right that our laws are being ignored now? Well, there's, it's, like, it's like a law. I mean, it's like the law is just, I mean, there's 11 million people here illegally that don't have permission to work, and most of them are working. So, I mean, there's just, there's no there there under the current law. There's no, so the president has provided some direction on this through his deferred action program. He said quite, and I agree with him on this, we have limited enforcement capability. We have however many ICE people, we have however many, we, we have an ICE detention facility in Aurora with 400 beds, we have Border Patrol, whatever our, they should focus on criminal aliens. That means people that are here illegally and have also violated our criminal laws. It could be they robbed a store, it could be they dealt drugs, whatever it is. Focus on that group, and by the way, there's plenty to focus on there. You don't even want to get to the kid who grew up here since they were four and was a valedictorian in their class and played football. I mean, yeah, they're here illegally, but given that there's 11 million people here illegally and we can only have, you know, deal with however many we can deal, I think we deported 200,000. Uh, focus on the, uh, focus those efforts on the bad ones. Um, so that's what we've been doing, uh, but it's not the solution. The solution is to have laws that are enforceable and enforce them. Um, and, you know, I hope we get there. They don't just take jobs, and if they create jobs for other people. Well, some do, yeah, you know, if you're an entrepreneur or a store owner and, they, you know, immigrants they need, are entrepreneurs. They need nurses just like Americans do. They mm -hmm. need food just like Americans do. So they don't just take jobs. They come here and spend money. So it's not all mm -hmm. one-sided. And that's all we ever hear, you know, that it's all, mm -hmm. but they're just take, take, take. But if you find this is the way, if you find this, if you find the legal framework to do it, you ensure that they pay taxes into the system. Because again, what's happening now, as the gentleman in the back said, is we don't know. I mean, some have somebody else's social security that they're paying. Some, I mean, some pay it, some don't. They pay sales tax, of course, if they're buying a store. But many probably don't. So you do this in an orderly way. You have employment verification that's mandatory. People get provisional work permits, all that stuff. Then you know that they're paying taxes in. Okay. Will you explain? I was unable to find it on the. Google, How, when people get, now they get, um, undocumented is the PC words used, now they can get a state driver's license. So when they apply for food stamps and um, go to the emergency rooms, are there, is there any verification, when you get food stamps, for example, do you have to give verification? Uh, yeah, none of them get food stamps, unless they're, you know, they're, they don't get food stamps. Medical care, they generally go to community health clinics. Uh, so many of them, if they have, for instance, an American kid, the American kid might be on uh, Medicaid or may not, uh, but they are not included in Obamacare, meaning they don't have uh, access, they can't buy insurance through the exchange, uh, and so they're not penalized for not having it. But it didn't deal with that group. That group can only be dealt with in immigration reform because I don't know how you deal with them in healthcare or otherwise. Um, because we don't want to give them any public benefits at the same time you can't require them to have healthcare if they don't have the assistance to get it. What about disability, which is what they increased yeah. um, how much, 64, 87? So no, they don't get disability. In the last year and a half? Yeah, they don't get any disability if they're here illegally. How do you know that though? You have to prove, um, you have to prove so you're if you're here illegally, well, you the last thing you prove you're a citizen to vote. I mean, I just don't understand. If you're here illegally, the last thing you do is you go, you know, deal with some government agency where you give them all your information. I mean, you're setting yourself up for a deportation order. So they generally fly low. 
yes, they can interact with the DMV now, but that's not, you know, that's not the whole government, that's the DMV. But they're not going to be going to a, uh, they, because they're not citizens, they can't get any of those public benefits. But like can they citizens. use their driver's license to vote? No, they're not allowed to vote. No, they're not allowed, but how do we know that they wouldn't be able to vote? It says that the driver's license says, license says you're not a, not a citizen. Oh, it does? Right yeah. Oh, I, okay, so that you can was identify what I couldn't them, find out. Uh, okay. Just by a glance at that, yeah. So, and by the way, I, I think that that's a good idea for driver safety. I mean, it's a symptom. I mean, that's certainly not the answer is to give you a driver. The answer is to fix this whole thing. But in the meantime, it's very, it's been very dangerous, and you've got people on the road without the public qualifications, and you have an accident with somebody who's uninsured. You know, and we all pay. It's, it's not a good problem. So we're talking about broken government. Yeah, broken immigration. government. And we're talking government. about health care. So broken. It's yeah. a good time for me to jump in. Sure. My policy. Uh, it was a major medical policy. It wasn't Obamacare mm -hmm. compliant. Um, it ends at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. August 31st is when it's over with. My premiums to replace that plan with a plan that's got to double the deductible are 80% higher than what my premiums were before. Obamacare is not working, at least for me, mm -hmm. And I don't think it's working for a lot of people. There are so many exceptions being made where this group or that group is getting it cut out or we're going to delay this part of it, we're going to delay that part of it, whatever. When are you, Representative Polis, going to say, I no longer can support this junk that we passed? Because well, there's got to yeah. be a point where this is no longer working and we're going to go somewhere else with it. Well, I certainly support changes to it. I'm happy to talk about some of the specific changes. I don't support going back to what we had before, which also wasn't working. Maybe I can ask how many people are doing better, worse, or exactly the same under Obamacare. And by the way, the vast majority of people, generally speaking, are doing the same because they work for companies that provide benefits, which doesn't change. But how many of you have an advantage or doing better under Isn't Obamacare? Isn't that supposed to family? change next year, though? Uh, from what right? you know now. Let's just say from what that you know now. That was delayed by Obama without... Well, that was the election. That was the simple question. The change well, because the, it was delayed. No, no, that was the, uh, the corporate mandate. Was right. most companies cover their employees anyway. So if you work for a company that doesn't provide benefits, then that's the part that was delayed. But that's not that's that's not most people. How many benefited from the provisions of Obamacare? Okay. Yeah, many people. Many, many people. people. How many are haven't noticed any difference? Same basically. Well, um, and then how many feel it's higher cost or worse quality? So. Um, so it's about a third, a third, a third. Um, I, you know, again, I, I think you'll find that in general, most Coloradans, most Americans, it didn't impact because they got their benefits from their employer. So like that's people who go to a job, and so it's a, you know, administrative or professional job, and that's how it works. The people that benefited in general were people that had pre-existing conditions or were self-employed, um, and and. Uh, or people that had pre-existing conditions work for a big company and wanted to kind of be an entrepreneur, start their own company, because there was really no way, very difficult for the high-risk pool and very costly for them to get their own insurance. Um, the folks who have to pay a little bit more, you're a good example, who had high deductible policies that were not, didn't meet the standards of Obamacare. Now you're going to be, you're paying more, now you get more, and you're going to say, well, I didn't want, you know, I don't want that more, I'm just no, happy with what I have. I'm so, not getting, well, you're, you're because getting the things more. they made me buy, yeah. I don't need. Well, no, so I mean, look, you know, there's the stuff that, I mean, that, you know, will affect women and people, but that's like a teeny fraction. You're definitely getting there you more. You um, take that yeah. back to Washington, D.C. <laughs> show that. So, in any event, Obama. in any event, uh, would love suggestions, <laughs> want to make this better. There's a lot of ideas. Uh, you know, uh, well, I, you, I, I you, hit, you just hit on it. Yeah. Uh, the pre-existing pre conditions is a very important thing. Yeah. But, gosh, you didn't have to destroy a sixth of the economy to do that. What? You know what? Well, health care is a sixth of the economy. It's improved. It's 18%. It's not improved. It may have improved for you, but it hasn't so, I mean, improved it's, a, it's improved, it's yeah, improved, yeah, it's improved yeah, for people that didn't have anything, because now they're getting something for free. Well, there's a, no, you're not getting well, something for free. Well, they have to pay, too. So they get a subsidy. So, free. so, so a they, lot of them, it's a subsidy, life. and then they have to pay part of the cost, and it's a sliding scale. Um, but, uh, you know, part of one, one advantage of it is, is it encourages people to kind of work their way out of poverty and, and to support themselves because it, it, the way it was before is you had a Medicaid cutoff and you earned a dollar above that, you lost all your health care benefits. So you literally, and I talked to people in our district, they earned 
you know, eight dollars an hour, and they, the boss said, "I'll give you a raise to nine fifty And they said, "No, I can't take a raise to nine fifty because me and my kid will lose our minute." And that's a stupid exactly. thing. Yeah, stupid. So that has been replaced, thankfully, that piece with the sliding scale. So now you get a raise from eight to nine fifty. You actually get to keep some of it. Some of it you have to pay for your health care, but you profit from that as you should. You don't lose your health care, you have to pay for part of it. You've got to keep that incentive structure in place. Um, the other goal of this is to reduce what, what we call uncompensated costs by making sure more people have insurance. Because you don't have insurance, you show up at a hospital, they still treat you. If you don't pay, they basically shift the costs on other people. And so by reducing that element, we hope it can bring it has the opportunity to bring down rates for everybody. So there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of parts that I'm not happy with, but there's a lot that we need to move move forward with as well. Yeah. So I just want to make a comment about that. I actually work in healthcare with the famous hospital, and um, I would take argument with anybody who says we're a little louder for everybody. that we're not better off because pre-existing conditions are no longer causing people to be uh, denied uh, insurance. We have more people paying, as you said, coming into the hospital again emergency rooms, we have to treat them. If you go to Children's Hospital and you walk into the emergency room, I mean, I think most people think an emergency room is a trauma bay. You know, you crash cars coming and stuff like that. That would be about 15% of our emergency room. If you go into Children's Hospital emergency room, you might as well go over to Conifer Medical Center. We have 50 exam rooms that look just like those exam rooms that you go to over there because all these people come in without that's the only place to get treated. And it's higher cost. So it's not to them. Not, not to them. No, but it's higher cost for all of you because you're paying for it. But right. you know, <laughs> exactly. transfer, we have to pass that on. We, we, yeah. we do that every single year. So we do have benefits out of this that are, to me, tremendous benefits. No lifetime caps. We have um, our kids are on insurance to 25 until they turn 26. That's for two, right? <laughs> No, it's all being, it's all part of what oh, really? be in the policies, and, and it benefits the country. <coughs> that the, the number one reason people went bankrupt in the United States before this was because of medical calamities. That's what caused people to go bankrupt. You would just get wiped out, and they. So I would say credit your, card debt because I watched those. Well, but I'm just saying the facts are is that's the number one. Some of that credit card debt is medical cost. It's the number one yeah, cause. Yes, and, and so you yeah. would have insurance, and then you would find out, well, we don't cover that, that, or we're not going to pay that, or we're going to drop That's what I'm finding out now. So, so we're part of cover prostate screen. So part of so part of this, so you know, emergency rooms they are used as essentially first line for a lot of people. Those many of those folks should be going to community health clinics, and so that's why out of the funding sources in this bill uh, that came in, we're bolstering community health clinics and also some additional subset will actually have insurance and then will no longer be uncompensated. So that's kind of, people sometimes ask, I have insurance, why do I benefit from more people who aren't insured having it? The, the biggest answer to that is, otherwise you're basically paying for them. So, um, you know, you're paying for them in the least efficient way uh, if they don't have insurance because they're going to the emergency room for, for and, and primary care. Like say one other thing, I worked for children for 16 years. Every single year we, I was there, we raise our suggest. I call it the suggested retail prices. Nobody pays unless you're self paid. <laughs> but anyhow, that's the posted price for every procedure. They went up 10 to 12 percent every single year for 16 years. This year, they only went up, I think, four and a half percent. I mean, we just because we couldn't, we couldn't raise it because the competition is so much greater. And so the rates are really beginning to change, unlike anything over My insurance rates went up 80 percent. 80%. Well, let's you know, work all the time. Okay. That, that's, we all know. That. Thank you. I uh, appreciate learning about your position on a number of domestic issues here. I'd like to return briefly to the international sure. and uh, I'm impressed uh, with your advocacy for a Kurdish state. I am just impressed that a representative from, from Colorado is involved in that. Seeing their delegation, I also appreciate your uh, mention in a positive light of the two-state solution to the Palestinian-Israeli question. Uh, in addition to that, I wonder if is without wait raising a big red, red flag here and waving it, uh, 
there's a growing sense of international outrage, as I understand, uh, about what's going on to the people, the humanitarian crisis that's being created in Gaza. Uh, our government has been very noticeably very quiet about that. Uh, have, is there anything you want to do? So, uh, first back to Curtis, I actually gave a speech on the floor of the House either last week or the week before supporting the establishment of the Kurdish state. So that was my first, I have been worked in the Kurdish caucus before. Last time I met with them, they said they're heading towards a referendum, so I wanted to, I, I hope my colleagues will, you know, support that direction if they choose it. So, um, last four years uh, in D.C., we have participated in a program called New Stories Leadership, where we have an Israeli and a Palestinian intern in our office together in summer, every summer. So we have, they pair an Israeli and a Palestinian. They, so if you ever call my D.C. office and somebody has an accent, that's because it's the Israeli or Palestinian intern. They actually just left for this year. But that we every year we it's been a great experience. So every year they've got to know one another. Um, they uh, you know establish friendships. This was the first year that it got very tense because the girl was from Gaza. Her parents uh, had to evacuate on five minutes notice from their house, and she didn't even know if their house was still there or not. She was calling home every day. Uh, it got very testy between uh, the young Israeli and the young Palestinian, so I don't know if the intent of the program was fulfilled in forging bonds that would last a lifetime. At least they know one another. It's very hard to do. So uh, America has been trying to be a broker of peace in the area. I mean, Kerry, Secretary Kerry has been over there nonstop trying to promote everything from short-term ceasefires to a path towards establishing a two-state solution. We obviously continue to condemn Hamas, which is a terrorist organization which unfortunately uh, rules Gaza. Um, they were elected in an election and they subsequently abolished all subsequent elections and inserted themselves in perpetuity. So they're not playing by the, the rules and the norms. Uh, we, just as we did with the Sinn Féin in Ireland, we've always extended an olive branch and say, hey, guess what, Hamas, if you lay down your weapons, uh, condemn terrorism, and hold an election, then you can be a political party. That's fine. If you win, we don't ever, but they have toyed with it at times. They're moderate element, but they've never accepted that. So in the meantime, they continue to launch terrorist attacks against civilian targets uh, in Israel. Uh, and uh, we obviously condemn that. Uh, the Israeli operation in Gaza has, uh, has killed innocent Palestinians. Um, and they have not targeted innocent Palestinians. In fact, they've taken every possible step they could to avoid killing innocent Palestinians. But nevertheless, there have been thousands of innocent Palestinians um, that have died in that conflict. So what should the American policy be? Again, I mean, I think this is, <laughs> these are, you know, these are, this is a deeply entrenched conflict. So, I mean, America can appear on high and force a solution for everybody. But encouraging the two sides to talk, getting them to the table, continue to encourage the Israelis to stop the settlements, encouraging Hamas to become a legitimate political party, encouraging discussions with Fatah that rules the West Bank about a comprehensive peace. Um, we obviously are sponsors of both the Palestinian uh, uh, West Bank and Israel and Egypt, which has its own complexities. We are, that's why we have a lot of leverage in the area. Uh, but, um, you know, there's no easy answers to that one. Quick, quick question. The Kurdish state? Yeah. Um, I understand the tribalism for all that area. I've got some friends that are in, from that area that have explained some of it to me. Um, is part of that area now is under ISIS? Is that what I understand? No, uh, the Kurdish area has been successful in defending those borders. Yeah, no, the, Kur I, that, the, the Kurds, so Mosul is a, a, a pluralistic city that has some Kurds in it, but the Kurds tell me that that is not part of what they consider their territory. But they took the Mosul Dam, which is north of it today. But the Kurds had. Yeah. Yeah. I said that. Yes, yes. Was that, was that yeah. just news? Yeah. Okay. So there looks like there is an incursion then. But uh, Mosul itself, the Kurds do not aspire to have sovereignty over. It has a Kurdish minority in it. Uh, they said that they are basically the autonomous zone within Iraq that currently represents their border is what they would seek to have as a state. And perhaps I haven't read, but today it might have been infringed upon. Yeah, I just was kind of curious because I understand that, that ISIS is trying to change their name now. To the Islamic State. Yes. Yeah. The caliphate. Yeah, that yes. was in the early verbs. Okay. Yes. So, an encouragement. Mm -hmm. What's going on in Gaza 
is precipitated by an oppression. And the behavior of those in Gaza can be pretty brutal. Hamas can be very brutal. IRA was very brutal. But if there's not an accommodation to lift this incredible oppression on the people who live in Gaza and the oppression imposed by the Israeli government on occupied territories in general, if that doesn't get lifted, this isn't going to stop. The IRA did not stop. The, the revolutionary of the United States did not stop until that oppression stopped. We're free because our version of Hamas yeah. kicked the British out of yeah. here. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's not, well, that wasn't our version of Hamas. Maybe um, I mean, well, it was Fatah. The, the, you know, the, 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 so, we didn't kill uh, we, Exactly. Our American revolutionaries did not target loyalist civilians. They were they were engaged in a military effort against British soldiers. Much Rogers. more noble endeavor, perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. But the IRA. Yeah. Well, that's is a, a better example. So these things have to happen at the same time, right? right. So again, Hamas, in, in a situation where Hamas lays down their their arms and, and and commits not to engage in acts of terrorism, yes, Israel needs to recognize the Palestinian state. So they have to go together. We don't and, and by the way, Hamas. That pressure, though. Hamas and Fatah and the Palestinians need to recognize the Israeli state. The Israelis need to recognize the Palestinian state. They're not going to happen out of sequence. They have to happen together. Um, so, uh, you know, the balls in both their courts are, you know, I mean, clearly Hamas is not going to do that unless they have the assurance that Israel is also going to do what, what they need to do. Um, so, again, uh, it's not an easy situation, but both sides, and there are people on both sides that want peace. There are also people on both sides that want, I guess, an intractable conflict. They're certainly acting that way. Uh, so those on both sides who want peace have to exert themselves uh, and, and forge a, a, a peace that is enduring. Netanyahu yeah, said yesterday, all they have to do to get us to stop is stop shooting rockets at us. Right. So I think if... So I it's think, two sides. If, if they stop shooting rockets at civilian targets, um, I think the Israeli incursions would likely stop. There's still some issue whether the tunnels, there's some tunnels that might be destroyed. But yeah. Thanks for letting me speak. I, I just wanted to get your opinion from a democratic perspective about the VA hospital situation mm -hmm. and how that is, Good how course. Obamacare and the fact that it's now triple in cost to what, what he said it was going to be a few years ago, how that's going to be any different than what's going on with our veterans uh, and how we're going to be treated as a population when we've only got a couple million veterans that are being treated by the VA and the fraud that's going on in there and, and the fact that that budget has gone up uh, tremendously in the last five years and we still got fraud going on. Sure. When we look at how the Obamacare rolled out, there's nothing but fraud. Everything that was told to us about uh, keeping our doctor and uh, lowering our costs, my own doctor his premiums has tripled this year. That's in 2014, it's tripled. My deductible's tripled. Mm -hmm. uh, next month, they start rolling out the new uh, insurance policies for, for companies and individuals for the 2015 year. So, well, what does it take for Democrats to look at cost skyrocketing, the fact that we're, we have fraud in the system, and nothing seems to be getting done? Well, so first I'm trying to dissect the question. So the VA issue, is an important one. It's, it's different than the Obamacare issue. VA. Uh, well, my point is, so VA, how are we going to be treated um, any be, differently than the people at the VA are being treated? They well, can't do. Well, the VA had several high-profile scandals. Uh, in Fort Collins, they had false billings. Uh, I joined those who wanted the secretary to resign. I should point out that, again, to be fair, this is these have occurred, you know, for years. This is under the Bush administration, the Obama administration. There have been problems in the VA. Uh, they really need a clean shop. We owe that to those who have served our but country. But we've thrown a tremendous amount of money the last five years. The VA budget has gone up considerably. So and what have we got for it? That's not related to Obamacare. Uh, well, that's Obamacare is now tripled. The serve. CBO says it's well, tripling the cost of what they said four years ago when, I, I don't, they, when no, they sold the program. Obamacare costs have not, have not tripled. Um, the CBO estimate for the cost of Obamacare tripled before they start counting it last month because there's been so many changes in the well, law. I have not waivers. seen those, uh, projections. From what I understand, the, 
the number of people in the pools and, and who've enrolled are roughly on target. Um, doesn't mean there's not improvements that can be made and suggestions. I just want you to. But the VA thing was unexcusable. Again, there were false billings in Fort Collins. Uh, I think it's appropriate that the secretary resigned um, and they need to clean shop. But that was not modified one way or the other in Obamacare. That's a that's a different system that has had some systemic problems um, for the last two decades. And and what I'm getting at is, it sounds like you don't feel that we've have problems with Obamacare already? No, I, I, I do. I've made that clear. I think, I, I, I mean, so I want to focus on what we can do to improve Affordable Care Act or make health care work. So I think there's a lot of suggestions that we have. So I mean, whether it's allowing, you know, interstate competition uh, between insurance, I support that. Uh, getting rid of the medical device tax, I support. That adds cost because it's within health care, so it doesn't, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. So there's there's a lot of changes I think we should look at. But, but I mean, when someone says, should we repeal it all, I say absolutely not. We're going back to something we know didn't work. And we need tort reform. It worked better tort than do more tort what we have I now. Support that. You know, we I have mean, an HSA set up. By the way, there is, there is some here, a little bit, Pi funding some pilot projects in the states. I would like to see uh, that looked at. Now again, it's not a game changer like some think it is. It's not, oh my god, but but it can have an impact. So anything that we can do to look at reducing costs. Um, What's the matter with the house health savings accounts versus the federal government trying to portable run Portable health savings accounts. Yeah. Getting the like government the out of No, I like that concept. We're trying to, I mean, I do support that. I, I uh, um, would be happy to look at any bills we're working on. I think if, if, if folks can can show responsibility and that they're not going to be a burden to others and through, do it through health savings accounts, there ought to be a way that they can do that and not be penalized. So again, not, the, the, you, you can't, you shouldn't be able to cheat the system. Like you say, oh, I have a health savings account, I have $500 in it, but guess what, when I need $20,000 worth of care, it's uncompensated care that others are paying for, that's what we're trying to get rid of. You can't just shift your cost into somebody else. But if you can demonstrate that you have health savings account, another fix I have is for Christian scientists. So Christian scientists came to us, and we have many in Evergreen. There's many of them. Maybe some in Concord too. They said, "We don't, we don't, we don't get health care. We, we don't, we we never going to go to the hospital. <coughs> we do our own thing through the church. Why are we penalized?" So I sponsor a bill that doesn't penalize any any, not just doesn't name Christian scientists. If you, as part of your religion, forego medical care. Um, then you are saying, essentially saying that you know you don't get medical care, so you shouldn't be forced to pay for it. So that's a good change too. So there's a lot of things like that. Yes. What about single payer or Medicare for all? Let's flip it around. Mm -hmm. Well, um, what, we have a next step yeah. after the ACA. They absolutely cover So another another change that I support would be allowing people that aren't yet the Medicare age uh, to buy into Medicare at cost plus ten percent. Uh, which some would, uh, and that would shore up Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, because it would provide cost plus 10 percent and provide an option. Because I hear a lot of people, I'm 61, I'm 59, I'm 63. I've retired, and I'm in this little gap period before I get my Medicare, and all my options aren't particularly good. Can I buy into Medicare early? So I, that would be a good thing, and that's one thing we don't. <laughs> I don't know if we have a bill on that or not. Um, I'd have to check. There was one last session similar to that, but I support that concept, um, and, and I think that would be a good improvement. I promise to go to her first and come back. Yeah. Well, I apologize if this was discussed. I uh, took a wrong turn. Um, I, we're all going to disagree and agree on different things, whether it's foreign policy or Obamacare or whatever. The, the critical thing is that the people we elect disagree too, but they've been unable to work with one another. Do you attribute that to the leadership, a Nancy and a Harry and a Boehner <coughs> and a whatnot, or are we just so partisan that we should vote everyone in the Congress out and bring all new people in? What, what's the solution? Yes. Um, so, it's a good question. So I'm part of a no labels group there where we have roughly equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans and we have breakfast and lunch together and we try to work on issues. Um, Certainly, leadership on both sides uh, should, has the primary you, responsibility of Can you vote of out the leadership? Make I any mean, other guys look bad. As well, a group? The leadership's decided by each side. Um, they, I think many, they, they largely see their goal as kind of beating the other guy, so there's that dynamic. I think before we started, I talked briefly with a few folks here about redistricting and reapportionment, and that's part of the problem is congressional districts. You have out of 435 seats, you have probably 350 of them where voters in the general election don't really get a say. That's true. And you have maybe said, well, no, you can all get a say. It's um, called uh, in, you know, in, um, uh, in, in, in November. So 
what California did, not the politicians, but the people, it was an initiative, is they replaced, instead of saying the politicians draw the lines, they said we're doing a true nonpartisan commission that can't even look at party registration data and they draw the lines. So the California went from worst to one of the best. Let me talk about worst. From 2000 to 2010, they had 52 seats and uh, a five elections, so 250, over you know, 260 congressional elections in that state, 52 seats, five different elections over 10 years. One seat changed hands <laughs> from Republican to Democrat. Jerry McNerney beat Pombo. One seat out of 250 races. So now, California went from worst to when voters passed it, it's, it's now one of the best. They have out of 52 seats, they have probably 12 or so, or 15, that are really competitive. And they've already, in the very first election, had several flip. And they, that could happen again this cycle. So you have accountability. Iowa and California do this. It's a state thing, not a federal thing, because states have the ability to do this. Not, not the, So I would encourage Colorado to do that. Um, and as I said, I, I think that members that are not in leadership can work through groups like No Labels and others uh, in a bipartisan way. Uh, most of the bills that I introduce uh, are bipartisan, certainly in education where I work. That we try to, uh, if they have any chance, we always, you know, it's, it's got to be bipartisan. So uh, another mm -hmm. bill that I've been working hard on is the Email Privacy Act. Right now, uh, without a warrant, uh, federal agencies like the IRS can actually legally access all your emails that are more than six months old. That's true. It's a shock to some people that they can. Yeah, my computer crashed. That's why. That was the NSA thing. <laughs> um, so uh, this bill would, would basically update uh, a law from the 1980s, it was before uh, email was really common or invented, to say you do have the reasonable expectation of privacy in your emails, which most of us think we do, and that the government needs a warrant to read your emails. Um, so uh, that's a bill that's bipartisan with Representative Yoder, and uh, we're now up to 250 or so co-sponsors. Did your education bill get through Two more. Center? Uh, not yet. We're, we're, See, that's the yeah. problem right now. It, it is. The House has passed 300 and some bills. Yeah. And well, how many of them got up here? Well, it's, well, it's happened both ways. Yeah. The Senate has passed some bills that the House hasn't brought either. But no, we have several education bills uh, that I have sponsored that are sitting there in the Senate. Um, the problem there, it's not Harry Reid per se, it's Tom Harkin. He's the chair of the Education Committee. He said, I want to do the whole ESEA reauthorization together. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> so I hope that there's still time where you can say, let's pick a few that we can actually do. Uh, and I think Harry Reid would go along with that. I don't think he's a problem with them. So it's not. It's just caught up in that. And Tom Harkin's retiring, so hopefully he'll say he wants some legacy and to get some of these bills through. Because the whole, this is the whole. Well, my goal too. I want to replace No Child Left Behind, right? I want to do that for you. Replace that with a better <coughs> educational. There's no question. But it ain't going to happen in the next few months. So let's at least take these few tweaks that we have that pretty much 80% of Congress we got to agreement on. And they're good, so let's let's do them. So uh, just two more. Uh, was there in back the young lady? Is there raising your hand or no? No. Okay. Yes. Uh, what what have you done to help return Sergeant Tamarisi, and what can I do? That was the same question as the gentleman asked. I will look I into that for you. For that. What's that? I didn't hear an answer for that. That's why I'm asking. No, I mean I told you I'd look I'd look into that for it's, you. It's just uh, unfortunate, that, right? Yeah, I mean I, I don't know what I what I how I, I made a long return. Try getting to it. Is he turned to come, come back across the Mexican border when he was moving? This would be like a letter to the Mexican yeah, he government should have, or something. He, he was going to be escorted back by one of the, the border guards because he just went through and was trying to U make a U-turn and come back. And they decided they weren't going to let him through, and they found two rifles or three rifles in his moving van. But right. He, it he sounds like it. He had him. He what? told him he had right. the gun. Right. It, was, it sounds like it was, what, what, what is he facing? Like, what He's kind been of in jail for five, been five months. Yeah. Yeah. Months. So, um, tell you what. He's uh, a political yeah. prisoner. But well, Frontier and Southwest yeah. and all everybody still takes their vacations there and spends their money there. Well, so what you're saying is that this sounds like it was an honest mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, now you know again, I don't know what the penalty is under Mexican law, but, but it sounds years in jail for a gun. For two gun, for, Well, that's ridiculous. But I mean, it's a sensitive thing because let's put it this way: somebody comes up here and they bring I don't know you know marijuana in down there where it's illegal. Uh, and they say, oops, I didn't mean to turn around, we're still going to face a penalty. But, you know, 20 years obviously is ridiculous. So I don't know, I mean, we need to, look, our, that's probably illegal in our country. He wasn't violating any laws. 
He, he um, was actually driving to California to take, get some PTSD uh, yeah. help. Well, um, let me see what I can do. I don't know what I can do, but um, it sounds just completely pressure. inappropriate to me that uh, it's five months now. That, yeah, um, over five yeah. months. The president's talked to the president of Mexico twice and hasn't brought it up. I don't know if you guys... I talk to uh, the president of Mexico every now and then. Uh, I certainly talk to the ambassador from Mexico more frequently, um, and I can inquire with the that'd ambassador. Be, be start. The treatment of our citizens versus the treatment that they get here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's, you know, I... I it's completely inappropriate. Again, as long as there's not more to it than you or I don't know. But what it sounds like is completely inappropriate. Uh, anything, anything else? Um, <coughs> you know, the Mexicans have, um, they're very sensitive about this. Now, he wasn't involved. With the, with, there are people that smuggle guns into Mexico. And so that's what they, they are very concerned about that because those guns wind up in the Eric cartels. Over. Right, well, <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, fast and furious, exactly. No, but, but I mean, this happens. Uh, that's why there's sensitivity about it is how much of the guns that are used in the, on their streets are smuggled in from America. Uh, yes, and a, a botched operation actually led to guns going to Mexico that we were supposed to be tracking. Um, but um, that's why they're sensitive about this issue. But um, this sounds like it's totally mistaken. So last, uh, last one. Uh, anybody who has not uh, said anything yet? Yes. Yeah. I'd just like to go back to the Israeli Palestine yeah. issue for a second. Mm -hmm. I've, heard, for this I've heard, you know, commentators say that one possible solution would be to settle the West Bank first before God's West Bank's under mm -hmm. the Palestine Authority. Yeah. They're not a terrorist group. Settle the West Bank. That would put that would settle that part of it and put more pressure probably on Hamas then to settle. Is that a goal feasible? Um, I think everything's on the table. I mean, it's not without its issues. Um, the the issues around the West Bank are what the borders would look like, because um, both both sides generally agree that Israel would annex a few areas that are heavily developed, that are suburban to their cities, but in exchange give the Palestinians areas of equal worth that are elsewhere. There's that. And the toughest part for Israel is they're going to have to, they would have to uh, uh, take, take down some of their settlements. Not most of them, but they've been identified. They'd have to take down some of them. That's very hard for an Israeli leader to do. Um, and so the challenge is, will Israel do that if they only get a half piece as opposed to a whole piece? I don't know. But, because uh, they still have Gaza outstanding, they want to address them both. But I don't, I mean, I, I don't think it's outlandish to talk about that. I mean, certainly um, in Abbas, you have a Fatah leader who uh, wants to, if he can, I think, uh, be a partner in the peace process. His capability of delivering is in question, of course, because it just, it just seems like when you keep using Hamas yeah. as a, yeah. this might overstate it, but kind of as an excuse not yeah. to go ahead and do negotiations. You're never going to be there. And, and, yeah, and there were negotiations. So there was around, I, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, that, that, where the Israelis and the uh, Fatah, they did sit down and they tried to work on the stuff and then it got dissipated because of everything that happened since. But they were, it's been in fits and bursts. Yeah. Um, so I think there are some on both sides that would, would take that opportunity. Um, so it's an honor to represent all of you. Uh, you can check out our uh, uh, webpage polis.house.gov. I'm on Twitter at Rep Jared Polis is the official one. Uh, we're on Facebook. Uh, you know, I love social media because that's how I kind of grew up with that stuff. So just you know, if you post stuff on our Facebook or tweet me, I'll see it and sometimes I'll reply. Obviously, you can call our offices, our Frisco, our Boulder, our Fort Collins, our DC office anytime. And uh, uh, I'm to represent you. Thanks for the great discussion and ideas that you have here today. And any particular ideas about changes to Obamacare, would love to hear them. I hope that there's a future Congress where we can do those. This Congress hasn't done any of those. They've just done repeal. But I think if we can get to the point where we can say, here's five or six things that Republicans and Democrats can agree on that make health care better, uh, that would be a very good thing for the country. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.